Discussing world-changing ideas through real conversations. Exploring the potential of technology to solve the most critical challenges facing business, people and the planet. Coming up... We haven't got used to this idea of 100-year lifespans, 50-year career spans. What always happens when people exit an organisation is that we have an exit interview. I would like us to have midlife check-ins instead. What flexibility do you need right now? Any issues that a midlife woman is facing is temporary. And then she's ready to go. So it's an investment now for the future. This is the Real Conversations podcast by Nokia. Here is Michael Hainsworth. Dr. Lucy Ryan explains in her book, Revolting Women, Why Midlife Women Are Walking Out. That when women step in after an absence from the workforce to care for children or dying parents, their energy and enthusiasm quickly dissipates. But through her research, she's learned that there are things forward-thinking companies can do to stem the mass exodus, and putting them in positions of boardroom power boosts the bottom line. We began by discussing how gendered ageism harms the workplace. Well, it harms the workplace, Michael, in that... What you're finding is that older women are exiting the workplace. So it harms the workplace in that uh, the more that older women are exiting the workplace, the less gender parity we have at senior leadership level, board level. So all our efforts for diversity of boards and for having a rich mix of men and women uh, leading our companies is being lost. So there's a loss of institutional knowledge as well as the unique perspective that half the population brings to any given board. Yes, you're absolutely right. Well, there's there's institutional knowledge that is actually leaking out, if you like, of uh, the system. There's research that's been done on this in the past um, for stock market investors. And we've learned that women make better investors because they are more risk adverse. Uh, Is there the same sort of research that's broadly done on the role of women in the workplace and at the board level? Because it seems to me, at least upon reading your book, that at the university level, when you were getting your PhD, they didn't seem to be at all interested in recognizing that there was a gap in that knowledge or doing anything about it. (laughs) Yeah, I mean, I, I think it's a funny thing, isn't it? So I, I go to try and find a supervisor for my PhD thinking there's a data gap and everyone will leap on it and be interested. I then found out there's a data gap because no one's interested. Um, I think that is that is improving, not at fast enough rate. So without doubt, there is a data gap about the positive impact of older women within senior leadership. Why is there that data gap? To what do you attribute it? Lip service has been paid to it. So up until now, we've managed to keep the system intact. And the system, let's face it, is mainly male at board level. So what we've managed to do is go round the problem by increasing female non-executive directors. So certainly in the UK, we can go, we've got 40% female NEDs on our boards. Ergo, there's not a problem anymore. But we actually have a major problem in that globally, we've got um, 11 to 14 percent female employed executives. So um, we're actually not solving the problem at all. We're going round the problem. And uh, basically, the system is staying intact. And that's suiting the people who are still at senior level, whilst the women are leaving silently. So what you're saying is that on the corporate ladder, the lower rungs are occupied in part by women, but the higher up you get, the less likely you are to find them. Why? Uh, Yes, definitely. So there's broken rungs at every stage. You're absolutely right. Bottom rungs of the ladder, lower leadership. In general, we've still got 50-50, 60-40. The higher up the ladder, the more broken the rung. Um, uh, The why, certainly in my research, there are three very clear reasons. Um, One is that the power structure um, is still very much intact. So uh, I would describe the glass ceiling as almost welded steel for the older woman. So they're not young, they're not full time, they're not male, and they are struggling to get through to that higher level. They also 
experience at midlife, what I've called a collision of events. And there's a certain amount of revolt also. They leave because they can and because they want to redefine their careers. They want to redefine career success in these latter years in a way that suits them. But companies today will boast of building diversity strategies. So the diversity strategies are robust, you know, in terms of maternity, paternity, gender, ethnicity, but age is very commonly left off um, the agenda and we're still tackling it. The why, I will still come back to the fact that up until now, it's still not of interest enough to organisations who are more wedded to keeping the status quo intact. So then let's come back to that idea of a loss of institutional knowledge and diversity. Can, can we quantify what it means to an organization to have more women on the board of directors? Are they more profitable? Are they more successful? Are they faster growing? Well, there's a ton of data now that says that if we have gender parity at board level, we have greater profit, greater performance, greater growth. And I'd go further, though. I'd also say that with once you've got gender parity at board level, uh, you also have your role models for the younger generation. And you, you cannot put a figure on that. You have a whole younger generation of women who can go, oh, I can be like that. If I can see it, I can be it. Whereas at the moment, what they're seeing is I can't really be it because they leave. So, yes, if we want to go economic data, there is a ton of data that goes, you'll be more profitable, more performance, and it's more. So they leave. Um, do they leave out of frustration or do they leave out of a societal expectation that when mom and dad get ill, it's the, the daughter that is the one who takes care of mom and dad? Uh, when a child is sick, it's mom who stays at home. Uh, these types of issues versus the I'm just fed up with my sexist boss. Yeah, uh, uh, both and, I'm afraid. A frustrating answer for you, but it's both and. So there is the I'm frustrated with my sexist boss. I don't want to do this. I want to live the rest of my life in a way that suits me or a different company that gets me and values me more. But there is a bigger issue of societal expectation. So still in terms of caring, 91% of women take up the caring load. And once you get to midlife, the caring load, they, you, you think your children are going to leave home and that, that caring load is going to decrease. It actually increases because then you've got family health issues, you've got parental uh, care, um, and you've often got uh, our older children with mental health challenges as well. So you've got a greater range of care issues and women are still expected to pick up that load. So if that's the patriarchal system at play, what of the, that 1950s style sexist boss component to it? The idea that there's still an old boys club. I, I, I was surprised at how successful I was in my career. I never played golf once with the boss. <laughs> and plenty of women play golf too. But there is what one of my interviewees called the uh, backslappy boys club still at play. And, and we, don't, we don't have to just call it out on the golf course. I see it more in terms of sponsorship. So what you'll see is men get greater mentorship, greater sponsorship, informally and formally. So they are shown how to navigate the whole leadership career path nationally, internationally, and they're given brilliant role models. Um, and women still don't get sponsorship in the same way or still the opportunities in the same way. But does the old boys club die when the old boys club dies off? Is there a generational evolution is what I'm asking? W one would hope so. You know, the, the, the Gen Z we're seeing come up the ranks have a greater knowledge about the importance of gender diversity. My but to that is that women are still taking up the caring load. So paternity and maternity 
is only at parity in Scandinavia. Um, in all other parts of the world, women are still taking up the caring load. And once we have that broken rung, it's only going to increase further on. So I'd like to think that this is just a, a gender evolution at the moment. And within one or two generations, it's going to decrease. But post-pandemic, that's not what we're seeing in the data. At the moment, they're saying that we might reach gender parity in 136 years. Didn't we say that 136 years ago? Oh, we certainly did. And we certainly said it in the 1950s. To, to your point about Gen Z um, or Gen Z, as we might say, <laughs> okay. in the Commonwealth, <laughs> uh, it, it, there is a pushback against the concept of always on, 24-7, I'm working. It, you point out in your book that there's a pushback by women generally over the age of 50 of, of the idea that uh, I need to be on call 24-7. Yeah. And, and I call it full-time foolishness, that we have got used to needing flexibility in our workplaces, lower down the ladders. When it comes to senior leadership, board roles, we are wedded to full-time 24-7. And until that's addressed, those figures at the top of our organisations are not going to shift. Um, and... And we have some solutions staring us in the face, such as job sharing. And that's not adopted uh, even vaguely enough. After this podcast, learn more about this and other insightful topics by going to nokia.com slash thought dash leadership. There you'll find additional information linked to today's podcast. I want to talk about some of the, the solutions um, to this problem because your book points out that there are there are three of them. But as we work our way towards that, I'm wondering if the pandemic helped us in providing some of those solutions. As you've pointed out, that women leave the workforce because they need flexibility. Even if they're older, even if they're empty nesters, there are reasons why a woman over the age of 50 needs flexibility in her work life. Mm -hmm. Has work from home helped in that flexibility or has it been a double-edged sword? Definitely been a double-edged sword. At first, it was like, wow, we can work from home and we can all be productive. What we then saw within about 12 months is everyone within the home went, wow, it's nice having you back at home. Now can you pick up uh, the housework, the caring load again? And it's become harder and harder for women to re-enter the workplace at the same level that they were at when they exited it to home. So what's happening is that men are entering back to the workplace at a faster number than women are. As well, women are leaving the workforce to attend to elderly parents or children with troubles and or their own health related issues. Sure. Whereas it, to your point, if it's the women who are doing the heavy lifting 90 percent of the time on family related issues and exiting the workforce, it's that much more difficult for them to re-enter the workforce, whereas the man has been climbing that ladder the entire time. And that's what I mean by that difference between a linear and a zigzag career. So uh, uh, stereotypically, men have a linear career. They enter the workforce and they follow a fairly steady trajectory upwards. And then they get to retirement, they get 60, 65, and they go, OK, I'm ready now to move into another phase of my life. What happens? Um, and I think, it's, I think it's great data. Uh, it was one of the most surprising things from my research is that it's like women are working from a different career clock, Michael. They're doing zigzag. They're stepping out, they're stepping back in. They're stepping out, they're stepping back in. Um, after they've, they're postmenopausal, their parents, sadly, have probably died. Um, their children are sorted. They're like, wow, I've got energy. I've got motivation. I've got talent. I'm ready to go here. I'm ready to step up. How come no one wants me? You interviewed 40 professional women about their experiences. And from what I understand, 70% of them said they want to step up. 
not step out. <laughs> it was what it was just so surprising. Uh, there I was thinking we were going to have interesting conversations about stepping down, stepping out. Um, and it wasn't. It was, let me have more of it. What an adventure. Let me work more. Let me let me step up. And it was the getting back in and being allowed to step up that just wasn't available. So therefore, they stepped out and are doing it in their own way. So women are setting up amazing companies. And, you know, what what a rich uh, source of uh, new businesses we have uh, set up by women. But what a loss to our organisations. So what's the motivator for stepping up? Well, there are several motivators for stepping up. One of the most interesting one that seriously is not talked about is what uh, is called the stealth motivator, which is actually the fear or witnessing of death. Now, who goes and says to their boss, uh, you know what, I'm, I'm leaving because I'm terrified of my impending death. So it's not a conversation that's ever had in the workplace. However, what you find with a lot of uh, midlife uh, women is they have witnessed death. They've witnessed their parents die. They've witnessed family and friends sadly starting to die. And they go, oh my God, I, I want to kind of have a, a good next chapter. And so that's one of the motivators, the stealth motivator. The, the other big motivator is that they've still got energy and talent to give that hasn't been realised in all these various steps in and steps out. You mentioned that with the stealth motivator in, in watching your parents die, giving you this incredible desire to make the most out of the next stage of your life is not a conversation you would have with the boss. But you point out that there are some simple changes an organization can make to better utilize women over 50, and one of them is prevention versus the exit interview. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I think that what always happens when people exit an organization is that we have an exit interview. I would like us to have midlife check-ins instead. I mean, how powerful it would it be to have good midlife conversations that is all about, so how is it going? What is going on in your life? What help do you need right now? What flexibility do you need right now? On the understanding that any issues that a midlife woman is facing is temporary. And then... And, and then she's ready to go. So it's an investment now um, for the future. And I think we haven't got used to this idea yet of 100-year lifespans, 50-year career spans. So we are used to women taking a step out from maternity. And we've got to get used to a midlife um, potential step out to step back in. So if... Prevention with midlife check-ins with employees and colleagues who are at that stage of their life is one of the simple things an organization can do to better utilize a woman over 50. What's another one? Look at their career paths and their training for midlife. The classic career path, if you, you, you hit 50, 55 from an organization, you are often offered training in retirement or financial planning or what you're going to do when you leave. And as uh, so many women I interviewed just said they were leaving because they were bored. They had so much creativity to give. So the second thing I'd do is I would look at the career path training that's offered to your midlife leaders. Uh, what are the creative things that they could do? How could they broaden their leadership horizons with you? And how could they use their talents across the breadth of leadership scope. Let's come back as to something we had discussed at the beginning of this conversation as an example of a simple change an organization can make to better utilize women over 50. You pointed out that there hasn't been a lot of good data about this at the macro level, but at the organization level, I can imagine you build a gender diversity or a broad diversity program, but if you're not tracking it, you don't know whether it's working or not. One of the first things that an organisation can do is decide if they want to take it seriously. So they need to add 
gendered ageism to their diversity agenda. So age is commonly left off the diversity agenda. We think we've we've solved it, age, because there's lots of policies about um, not uh, uh, not disavowing people from the workplace because of their age. So ageism and gendered ageism actually need to be added to the diversity agenda and tracked so that organisations start to actually look at what's happening to their women over 50. As someone who is in that age group, um, I'm finding there are a lot more women uh, over 50 who are choosing to not dye their hair anymore. <laughs> there are younger women who are saying, you know what, I'm going gray at 20, 25. I am going to just let that happen. <laughs> you mentioned Gen Z. Are you optimistic that the next generation is going to make things that much better for the organization and for the next generation of women over 50? Are you optimistic for the future? I am very optimistic for the future. I have to be. I've spent the last 10 years studying this. And um, so, you know, small wins in my in my world are, are small wins, but they are progressed. You're right. There's been so much uh, uh, talk about grey hair. And I still remember being uh, told how brave I was to sport white hair. Um, so what I thought was cool was actually not in other people's opinion. I am optimistic that the generation coming forward are less wedded to the way we look. And I will be so curious as to whether that continues when they get post 50. Um, you often find that the minute a woman turns 50, she starts really worrying about the colour of her hair and uh, uh, so much is talked about the way she looks and you only have to look at the media to see that our women in power more is written about the way they look and the way they dress than their policies but I still hope that the generation below us is less wedded to that. If there's one thing to take away from this conversation what should it be? For organisations, the one thing would be take it seriously. Find out, show it matters, act. I know that's three things, but take it seriously. Look at it. Look look at your population. Well, I, I, I'm wondering if we're starting to, to swap our, our identities here because I turned 50 and I am getting more and more concerned and, and dyeing my hair more and more frequently <laughs> than I ever did before. <laughs> I, I need to be taking a page from the next generation of, of women. Yeah, swap to my side, Michael. Go white. Building a future that's productive, sustainable and inclusive in a world that acts together. Discover how by visiting Nokia.com slash thought dash leadership.